I just want to welcome all of you and thank you for being here today. I was very pleased and interested to hear Ed say that they too borrow works uh, from sculptors uh, for no fee but for paying the shipping and installation costs, which is the model that we've been using as well. So um, we haven't quite gotten to Mark de Suvero yet, but who knows? <laughs> So I'm going to give you a little background about the three artists. Thank you. Okay. The first is Sean Cassidy. He was born in Carshalton, England in 1966, but lives and works now in um, South Carolina. He studied sculpture at the Norwich School of Art in Norfolk, uh, UK, receiving a BA with honors in 1988 and worked that year as a studio assistant for British sculptor Anthony Caro. In 1991, he finished his graduate studies in sculpture at the University of Alberta in Canada, and since 1991 has been making sculpture in the US, where it has been um, exhibited quite extensively. He's had exhibitions at Socrates Sculpture Park in New York State, Franconia Sculpture Park in Minnesota, the Forum for Contemporary Art in St. Louis, and the De Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park in Massachusetts. In 1995, he exhibited five large-scale sculptures at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Marseille in France. He has been awarded residencies at over 10 venues, including the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire, the Jurassic Resident Artist Program in California, Sculpture Space in New York, and closest to us, the McCall Center for Visual Arts in North Carolina. His work has been reviewed and featured in Art in America, New Art Examiner, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. He is currently an associate professor of sculpture at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. He is has previously and is now uh, working on another commission for the Charlotte Area Transit System Arts and Science um, uh, or Arts Program for CATS. This is uh, one for the first part of the blue line that they built. Um, he was commissioned to do these 40 inserts along the railway or along the guardrail of the uh, track itself. And if you look carefully, you'll see that they're leaf forms. They're like a kind of ginkgo leaf. Some of them, they're turned in different directions. In this case, the one um, on the left, the um, sort of stem of the leaf is pointing upwards, and you see part of it's in green, and then the rest of it is in uh, wrought iron within the iron of the railing itself, or the steel. This is a piece that he did with Tom Stanley, a fellow professor at Winthrop University. Um, they often collaborate together. Uh, you can see this is a very large piece, 33 feet high of stainless steel. And I think what's interesting about it as I look at it, um, they have echoed both the uh, columnar um, detail of that uh, beautiful kind of arbor way or walkway, whatever it is, uh, as well as the trees uh, in the vicinity of the piece itself. This is another project he did for the Federal Credit Union in Raleigh in 2007 called Journey, and you can see how he uh, cut out this aluminum and um, really on the theme of a journey. Uh, you know, you've got the windows. It's almost it's interesting to me, since he worked on the rail system, to think that it's almost like something on the rail, like you're, you're on a train and you're passing this vista going from window to window and element to element. Now, this is the piece we're looking at um, today. It is called Dark Stance, painted and prime, primed and painted steel. It's 120 inches high. So that's 10 feet by 4 feet by 4 feet is the footprint of it. Um, it, okay, I am characteristic of some of his work is, uh, or much of his work is a kind of ambiguity that is a bringing together of various elements into a kind of hybrid that is uh, something beyond the sum of the parts. Now I looked up, I searched 
the term dark stance because I was curious where it came from and found on Google, the wonder, you know, source of all information these days, uh, that dark stance refers both to a role-playing guild in the video game Star Wars Galaxies and a music streaming icon. Now, both of those things may make much more sense to those of you who have teenagers than they do to me. But um, I thought it was a little bit interesting because this is a hybrid. It's, it's a little bit futuristic looking in a way. You'll see that um, on this side, it references a piano. But of course, the, um, what do you call that, that goes over the keyboard is closed. Um, there are no pedals. There's no bench, of course. And on the other side, there are big speakers. And um, of course, the speakers, you can't hear anything from them. The piano doesn't play. And there's this platform up on top that you can't really get to. So um, the wonderful people, I think Beth Bolton did this for us. So she, um, her company photoshopped this into the site so that you'll have a chance to see what these pieces actually look like in the location and with the relative size and scale of the piece. Is, is, that, is that metal? It's painted steel, yes. So um, it would hold up quite well out there. And you get a different view from the other, from each side. I'm sorry we don't have a view of the opposite side of the piece, but I think, you know, as people drive by it, they would, uh, gain more and more information in a way and start to think about what is this piece and gain some of the references, pick up on the references. And um, of course, in the end, it's all kind of, um, I don't want to say futile, but uh, it, it is this kind of odd hybrid that does not do what it represents to do. This is Evan Lewis. Um, this is, we're actually looking at a piece that we looked at last year. Um, he grew up primarily in Santa Barbara, California and received his BFA in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He was born, however, in New York City in 1958. He's been producing and exhibiting outdoor kinetic wind sculpture since 1984 and is executed major public commissions such as one for Expo 88 in Brisbane, Australia, the McCormick Convention Center in Chicago, the Art District in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Northern Illinois University at DeKalb, and others in uh, cities in Denver, East Lansing, Michigan, Cleveland, Phoenix, and more. In 1995, he was commissioned to produced sculpture that featured prominently in Warner Brothers' film, Twister. He's had two recent commissions, one for the Veterans Glass City Skyway Tribute, uh, Tribute Memorial in Toledo, Ohio, and which you can see here on the uh, right of your screen, which is, um, again, a, it's a kind of pavilion with a kinetic, kinetic element up on top. The other piece um, was done for the Beale Street Landing in Memphis, Tennessee, and is his largest uh, piece to date. And that area is a newly revitalized riverfront on the banks of the Mississippi. Uh, Lewis, too, has an extensive list of exhibitions and awards to his credit, including Avenue of Sculpture at Art Chicago 2011. Um, he uh, was involved in an invitational show at Garfield Park Conservatory in, Conservatory in Chicago, and he continues to live in Chicago, and the seventh Rosen Outdoor Sculpture Competition at Appalachian State, where he received the Rosen Award. Like many of his works, this is a kinetic kind of weather vane almost. The top portion is stainless steel and aluminum. It is 15 feet high and the base is essentially five foot on a side. It's hand-formed metal or mild steel, and um, the base is actually assumed to require a patina over time. The main portion always points into the wind. The two side fins kind of swim in the breeze, and um, it can rotate a full 360 degrees.
Here it is in situ. So you can see it relative to trees um, and the nice plantings of flowers that are there. All right, Beverly Pepper is our third uh, artist. She is an American who was born in 1922 in Brooklyn, so she is now 90 years old. Um, I'll show you her work in a few moments. Uh, at age 16, she entered the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn to study advertising, design, and photography, and then embarked on a career as a commercial art director. She studied art at the Art Students League in New York and attended night classes at Brooklyn College, including studying art theory with a man named Jerry Kepish, who had come to this country to found the Bauhaus um, at the University of Illinois. Kepish introduced her to the work of uh, Maholi Naji and Man Ray, and it was also at this time in her mid-20s that she met the environmental artist Fed Frederick Kiesler. She was drawn to post-war um, Europe in 1949, where she studied painting in Paris uh, with Cubist painter André Lot and with Ferdinand Leger at his atelier. She eventually moved away from the art of painting and focused solely on sculpture. Since 1972, she's divided her time between New York City and Todi, Italy. Here's a piece in Pistoia, Italy, as you can see. And keep this in mind because it's similar to work that we'll be seeing for here. Um, she has numerous awards. Uh, in 2011, she was named the National Academician from the National Academy Museum and School. She's won the Alexander Calder Prize for Sculpture. She, was the, uh, she received the Pratt Institute Legends Award, which I love. Um, outstanding achievement in the visual arts at the Women's Caucus for Art, and has two honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degrees, one from the Maryland Institute of Art in Baltimore and the other from Pratt Institute. I counted on her resume that she has had 80 solo international exhibitions. Um, in leading commercial galleries such as Marlboro and Andre Emmerich in New York and Zurich and John Bergruen in San Francisco. She has shown in so many places, um, Florence, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New York, the Metropolitan Museum, Albright Knox Art Gallery, MIT List Visual Arts Center, um, and the Contemporary Sculpture Center in Tokyo. She's had more group exhibitions and publications in review that I'm not even going to bother to summarize them. And she is in public collections around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona, the Dallas Museum of Art, Denver Museum of Art, Hirshhorn Museum of Art and Sculpture Garden, the Jewish Museum, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Walker Art Center. And that's a sample. <laughs> She began actually by integrating wood carving and metal casting, and the art critic Rosalind Cross described her work as violating modernist traditions. And since that was a male-dominated canon of the time, I think it was both smart and risky for her to do that. In the latter 1960s, she turned to polished stainless steel, her work was being displayed outdoors all the time, and so she even moved into using the earth itself as sculptures. So she, would, she was one of the early earth or land artists carving the earth itself into sculptural forms. While she was working at a U.S. steel factory in, I have to say this, Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, if that's right, <laughs> she was given Corten steel, and she was in fact one of the first, if not the first, artists to begin um, working in Corten steel. She has also worked a great deal, here's a giant example of that. Uh, she's also worked a lot in um, cast iron. I mean, these pieces are enormous. I don't have the dimensions, but you know, it's probably 30, 40 feet high, maybe more. So here uh, from 1981 is a group of works, um, one of which is in the threesome, the pairing that we will be looking at. 
and that is the piece right up front with the kind of cutout, which is called um, mute, mute Presence. Here's another installation of these individual pieces. Um, she, and the three pieces we're looking at, grew out of her interest in creating multiple individual elements, as you've seen, that form a kind of environment together that you might walk through or experience as, um, certainly as a group. Barbara Rose, who is another leading critic, talked about this element, this idea or this theme of one element kind of being born of another, expressed by a sequence of vertical elements that, quote, progressively become detached from their context as children individualize themselves from their parents. So this theme of genesis and continuity is very important to Pepper's work. And I think you can see that, you know, they're kind of three personages almost. Um, she does refer to them as sentinels often, and um, I will show you how they would look installed here. They vary in size from between, um, oh, like nine feet to 12 feet altogether. And they would be grouped. That may not be the exact configuration, but we've just, uh, or I should say Beth Bolton plugged them in there for us to see. So those are the three artists. Um, Sean Cassidy with the, we should have had all three at the end again. Sean Cassidy with the piece Dark Stance. Evan Lewis with the three liner, the kinetic piece. And then this group of three works by Beverly Pepper. Now are there any questions about any of the work? I'd be happy to try to talk more. Pardon me? It's cast iron. Yes, and I'll just add that uh, we do have a plan to put better lighting on that location, so any of the pieces, and they're all, well, Sean's and Beverly's are both a little bit on the darker side, uh, but we will have lighting, so they'll show up very well. They'll be fine during the day, but at night they'll also be very visible. <laughs>